Yeah, so I'm uh, delighted to have Pierre Giacomo Severini uh, here today, and he graduated in Philosophical Sciences at the University of Macarata in 2016 with a thesis on the tragedy of action and different interpretations of Sophocles Antigone. And he was a visiting PhD student at the University of Zurich from September uh, 2018 to June 2019. And he earned his PhD in human sciences from the University uh, G. D'Annunzio of Chieti Pescara in 2021. His uh, thesis entitled uh, Being is Doing With Freedom and Ex Existence in Jean Hersch is being published in the Yeshwabe Publishing House in November 22. And he has been a postdoctoral researcher at the University of the Anunciation of Kieti Pescara uh, since February 21, and is working on a project entitled Jean Hersch Between Philosophy and Human Rights. And today he's going to talk about Jean, Jean Hersch as well. Uh, and you can si see the title here. It's on her pedagogy, um, a wonderful way to freedom. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, Pierre Gacom. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining this talk. And first of all, please let me thank Clara for the idea of creating and organizing this talk series on such an always actual issue as education. You should already have received by email the paper where you can find all the references and maybe some more details on some passages or concepts. I have joined the past talks and maybe my talk will be a little different because Janesh does not justify or reflect on the importance of educating women. And she just reflects on the role of education in the free existence of the human being. But we can discuss this after my talk. And so we can start and let's have a look at the plan of my talk. This talk aims at presenting the ground of Hirsch pedagogy of life and showing in which way wonder can found such pedagogy, leading to some essential consequences for philosophy and education. In the first part, I analyze the theoretical foundation of Hirsch's early philosophical reflection and its practical implication to state the role of wonder in it. In the second part, I present Hirsch's pedagogy of life, highlighting again the importance of wonder. In the third part, I try to show in which way Hirsch's theoretical findings can offer some valid principles in education and contemporary issues. And they show in which sense educating human wonder is needed in order to exist authentically and freely. So the part one about wonder between l'illusion philosophique and l'être et la forme. Before analyzing Hirsch's most consistent theoretical text, please allow me a remark, because in this talk, I am frequently recalling authenticity, but what is exactly authenticity to Hirsch? Hirsch doesn't give a comprehensive and clear definition, probably because authenticity is so recurrent in her reasoning so she does not feel the need to further define it, but she implicitly rejoins her teacher Karl Jaspers, stating that authenticity is a part of faithfulness that freely and completely witnesses in the existence what is worth for the subject, as it is clarified in her contributions on Jaspers and especially in L'Illusion Philosophy and probably just analyzing illusion philosophy will help us to understand this definition. But before analyzing illusion philosophy, it is necessary to consider Hirsch's graduate thesis entitled Les Images de l'œuvre de Messier Bersan, because it is in this text that Hirsch talks of freedom for the first time, clashing with Bersan's definition of freedom as organic development namely the necessary and free capability of the human being of actualizing one's authentic nature in reality. Ersch appreciates the idea that we have a natural tendency that roots freedom in reality. Nevertheless, to her, this freedom has not a solid basis. 
Thanks to Jaspers, Hirsch finds that freedom is rooted in existence as well. And at this point, l'illusion philosophique comes in. In this text, Hirsch states that Jaspers definitely unmasks the limits of reason. So pretending to state something objectively true about transcendence through philosophical systems is just an illusion. Today, we are not studying the past philosophical systems for the knowledge they bring, but rather for their being an example of authenticity that can wake up our freedom. To Hirsch, philosophy is grounded in the philosophical problem, will I be or will I not be? When the human being decides to become the subject of an object that is worth for her, since no objective truth is knowable, such decision is not determined by an objective knowledge, but rather by a free engagement. And here lies the double root of freedom, because we have the natural tendency of feeling that something is worth for us, but only a subjective decision can lead us to engage ourselves as the subject of such worthy object. To Hirsch, the object that we feel as unconditionally necessary is the simple gesture on which we ground our life and thought, and it becomes the metaphysical truth of our existence, because no physical knowledge can force us to choose it. Hirsch defines existential, the freedom through which we decide our metaphysical truth, and philosophy becomes the history of how the philosophers used their existential freedom in exemplary ways. We can mine those philosophers to understand how to engage our freedom. And I will come back to the meaning of mining in the next slides. But what is important to highlight here is the role of wonder in those existential dynamics and in which sense there is no philosophical experience or existential freedom without wonder. In L'Illusion Philosophique, Hirsch's reasoning is still general, and she says that for the philosopher, I'm reading the first quotation, the activity goes from the willingness of being, explaining herself and expanding herself, taking over the world of the objects, to reaching the completely formulated system. But in the Philosophique in 1981, she points out that every authentic philosophical experience moves from wonder, and thus no existential freedom would be possible without wonder. And I read the second quotation. What I will try to show through some example chosen among more than 2,000 years of Western thought will be only in which way and in front of what some human beings are taken by wonder, by the same wonder from which philosophy was born. Being capable of feeling wonder is particular to the human being. It is all about raising up again that wonder. Thanks to the example of the other, the reader will regain her ability of feeling wonder. Wonder is essential to the human condition. We have just seen, thanks to L'Illusion Philosophique, that the decision of existential freedom is the theoretical ground of Hirsch reflection and the edge of the subjective metaphysical being. But as we have anticipated, such theoretical findings need some practical content and must be considered in their practical implications. Hirsch needs 10 years to think at those problems, and finally she publishes Lettre et la Forme in 1946, in which she investigates the conditions for something to be real from a human point of view. In this text, Hirsch states that the Kantian thing in itself is unknowable for the subject. So the subject exerts her hold on it as a matter from which to take a form that fulfills her reality. Such ontological dynamics that give form to the objective matter must be connected to the metaphysical and moral horizon of the subjective existential freedom that we have just outlined in L'Illusion Philosophique. And in this regard, Hirsch says that the mission of the human being is being the incarnator. To Hirsch, the human being must incarnate in a real form the worthy object that she decides, thanks to her existential freedom. 
when she gives a judgment of value and she states that such worthy object is not in the world yet, but it deserves to be there. This means that the engagement of existential freedom in all its metaphysical way must be actualized, says Hirsch, in a real good life in the world. The metaphysical and moral engagement that we have found in illusion philosophy needs a gradualist ontology for becoming real. And so we can define ontological such freedom that incarnates and gives a real form to what is work. It is important to highlight that also in this practical activity, wonder has a central role because the wonder described in the Tournament Philosophique lies also behind the judgment of value that helps the subject in deciding what to welcome in her reality. The authenticity of human existence is determined by the positive free decision of incarnating what is wonderful and subjectively worth. And in this regard, we can read the words that Hersch uses in Le Tournement Philosophique. Everyone of us, in fact, has her own philosophical experience. Every time that we face the necessity of taking a true decision, we make questions to ourselves in a philosophical way without knowing it. Children in their fifth year of life make questions in a philosophical way. Young people of 15 or 16 years too. The radical philosophical wonder of ancient philosophers, which was completely new at that time, witnesses in fact the creative power and the inventive ability of the human being. Recognizing their wonder, the reader will say, yes, it is exactly like this. How is it possible that I had not felt wonder for this thing yet? Like children, says the Bible, we have to become like this if we want to understand what it is. Now, let's move to what Gaston Fessard has defined the pedagogy of life that can be retraced in Hirsch's philosophy. In the book Éclairer l'Obscur, Hirsch appreciates this definition, but she never deepened it. In this part, I will try to explicit Hirsch's pedagogy of life thanks to some consistent studies on Hirsch. Such explicitation of the connection between theoretical decision and practical engagement should show the passage from philosophy to education and the importance of education in making a good use of the philosophical findings. De Vecchi states that in the first half of her life, Hirsch has tried to develop a philosophical practice that theorizes how to live a good life, while in the second half of her life, Hirsch has tried to develop a practical philosophy from such philosophical practice. To De Vecchi, Hirsch engaged in issues that were relevant to her and proposed practical solutions thus becoming a model of how to give a real form to the objects that were worthy to her. She thus developed a pedagogy of life that always tries to bring the facts of one life back to the meaning one gives them. Remembering the ancient distinction between paroxysm and poiesis in the pedagogy of life, the philosophical practice fixes existential decisions on a praxis and the practical philosophy leads to an existential poiesis of such praxis in the world. We can conclude that engaging the existential freedom in an intention of good life is useless if the intention does not use the ontological freedom to give a form to the existence in reality. After having presented the theoretical foundation of the pedagogy of life, it is necessary to deepen the attitude that is linked to such pedagogy, because we have just stated that good intentions are useless if they do not bear real and practical fruits. In this regard, Tarantino concludes that to Hirsch, being is doing, and the human being can exist only incarnating forms thanks to her freedom. When thinking to the right approach to the worthy matter, Tarantino comes back to a category that we have already mentioned in the Illusion Philosophy, namely the mind. To Hirsch, mining means borrowing one's freedom to another subject or another object in order to feel wonder for the unicity of such matter. 
Since it is impossible to understand logically that something deserves to be, mind approaches its object with a pietas as a sympathy towards its object. Actualizing freedom is not a solitary reflection and we need to meet our objects and the freedom of the other subjects, as we have already seen in Lirusian philosophy. So in this sense, Tarantino speaks of active receptivity, namely a form of humility that welcomes the object that produces wonder and dialogues with it to actualize freedom in a better way. And we can read how Tarantino defines active receptivity. Active receptivity means saying yes to the word of the other, to her freedom, means prepare oneself to welcome everything problematic, paradoxical in life, because it is only from there that the irreducible appears. It means, in other words, opening oneself to the comprehension of the other. The possibility of mind, of subjective identification, is given only through this active receptivity that represents one of the fundamental elements of every teaching. Before moving to the third part, I would like to make two further considerations on the feelings that are linked to wonder. Consideration number one. The Monticelli observes that the initial mute and unarmed émerveillement that we feel in front of the worldly object is not sufficient, and candor as desire of communication must be added to the initial surprise. The one that feels wonder in the right way is amazed and grateful at the same time. She finds something to communicate and a good reason to communicate it. Only in this way, wonder becomes the basis of mining, and it implies the desire of giving a real form that everyone can see to the object that is worthy. This is what the Monticelli defines desire of restitution. And we can have a look at what she writes here in the quotation you can find in the slide. We will conclude coming back to the initial move to the experience in which takes root the ontology of doing and work. The desire of restitution, we were saying, fed with gratitude, which unites everyone that aims at giving back something of the being that hit them in the discipline of the form without naming it in vain. This move of soul is wonder. From wonder, traditionally, it is said that philosophy is born. But the ancient word étonnement is stronger than émerveillement the unarmed and initially mute aspect of wonder, and without suppressing the one of admiration, it underlines the one of candor. At the root of every loyal restitution of truth, at the bottom of every mining, there is wonder. Hirsch considers a farther situation, which constitutes my second remark. When wonder does not welcome its object and it is separated from its pietas or its desire of restitution, it is converted in the content for what is shallow. In this case, as we can see in Heidegger's philosophy, wonder is not a gift to take care of and transmit, but rather an object of possession, which is violated in its intimacy and becomes an instrument of superiority. And again, Hirsch's words are quite effective. We can read them in the slide. In the heart of the philosophy of Heidegger, we find that power, the most alive in his thought, which is not the wonder in front of being, but the content for everything is not this wonder, in its nudity and sterility. A burning content, passionate, obsessive for what is common, Exerting content, what Heidegger refuses is the whole human condition in its mixed nature between finitude and finite, with its endless effort, modest, historically situated in time and history, towards and despite of death. So let's move to part three, which is the last part of my talk and also the most important for this talk series about wonder in education. Finally, we have all the theoretical notions that are necessary for understanding in which sense education is needed for enhancing the pedagogy of life and the incarnation of an authentic existence. 
and for considering education one of the most important practical engagements in Hirsch practical philosophy. We will see that also in education, wonder plays a central role. First of all, here you can find some relevant events in Hirsch's life which can let us understand the importance of education to Hirsch throughout all her life. As you can see, she taught uninterruptedly for 44 years, from 1933 sorry, to 1977, and she also was the first woman professor teaching at the Swiss University, in particular, the University of Geneva. In Eclairé l'Obscur, which is a long interview in which Hirsch recalls the most relevant experiences and reflections of her life, Hirsch defines herself as a teacher of school rather than a philosopher, since she prefers searching for practical answers to concrete problems. To Hirsch, the philosopher shares her engagement towards freedom and wonder, but the teacher has a bigger responsibility since she has a more active role in the education and dissemination of wonder. As we have already seen, the mission of the human being is being the incarnator, but only a good approach to wonder leads to an authentic ontological practice. So a proper education to wonder is the condition of every form of human incarnation. Educating to Hirsch means leading to freedom thanks to a mind that restitutes one wonder to the others while welcoming the others and thus creating the self. I think that it is possible to conclude that to Hirsch, to every human being, freedom is the ground, wonder is the attitude, and mind is the way to be followed. This is the theoretical principle that we can get from Hirsch reflection and pedagogy must educate to applying such principles. To her 1968 youth uprisings, which she witnessed in person being in Paris at that time, are the right occasion for reflecting on the educational situation in and out of school. Nowadays, to her school is failing, promoting a general anesthetization and the system that sacrifices authenticity and forms teachers that prefer passive students in order to make schools safer and under control. While to Hirsch, the good educator should find the way for giving to every class and to every student the right categories for linking concepts and notions freely so that every student can find new answers and feel new forms of wonder. Contemporary education becomes an escape from uncomfortable duties and a way for remaining undetermined objects rather than responsible subjects that determine their personal reality. And we can conclude this reasoning reading Herr's word on the role of the educator. Here we have the dialogue between Jeanette Schrewich and the interviewer Gabriel Dufour Kovalsk. And Hirsch says, for all my life, I have heard repeating until board of the principles of active school without having stated the true progress. The theory of active school indeed is not yet the active school. Interviewer, pedagogy is a practice. Hirsch, it is a practice, a practice that is grounded on the student and the teacher, on the circumstances and on the game in a class. It involves a part of constant inspiration. Interviewer, a part of improvisation. Hirsch, yes, from this point of view, the first advice to be given to a young teacher is a ban. Boring is forbidden. Interviewer, one must never surrender to the supposed boring aspect of the transmission of knowledge. Hirsch, exactly. The second advice is to surprise. The French youth uprisings arrived in Switzerland a few years late in 1980, but the impact of youth demonstration was, however, very strong. Therefore, a federal youth commission was appointed to open an inquiry and try to suggest guidelines to be followed in the future. The thesis published by the commission that became a great bestseller all over Europe justify the use of violence by young people as a response to school repression and to the lack of sufficient opportunities for them to find their place in society. 
On this occasion, Hirsch decided to oppose to the thesis, and she published her antithesis entitled L'Enemy Cell Nihilism, which are her most relevant contribution on education. To Hirsch, education and youth uprising are a relevant issue because the young person faces an initial disorientation in front of possibilities that seem all the same. And this is exactly the first clash with matter that the human being must face as incarnator. So it is essential for the young person to have a better support when facing such clash. The test promote an unconditional freedom that means absence of limits for the young person. And this leads to Hersh, to the slogan, everything is permitted. But to Hersh, the young person feels alone and disoriented in such open and isolated lands. And here we can read Hersh's words, the first quotation of Bible. It is claimed that young people have always suffered and continue to suffer repression, but the opposite is true. Some of them feel lost without a compass in front of the infinity of possibilities that for this reason lose their meaning. When it is not important where one goes, why going somewhere? Everything is allowed and everything is possible. It is enough then to discard the world of others to find the easy satisfaction of heaven. To Hersh, since the beginning of her life, the human being searches for models rather than for a free space, and she needs someone that resists to her so that she can form herself to such flesh. In this sense, the federal autonomous centers proposed by the commission would become a form of enhancement of nihilism, because those centers should be place, places sorry, where the young person can be absolutely free and experience whatever she wants. And it is exactly for this reason to Hersh that they would be like doors open on the void of the aforementioned and everything is permitted. It must be clear that the fact that the young person need models does not mean that she has to be the copy of someone. Models are the data the past on which it is possible to build something, but the past can be enhanced, modified, or even denied. It is always there as the solid basis of the building of existence. And we know that the more the bases are wide, the more the building can be high. Again, we can read Hirsch words, the first quotation of this slide. This initial situation of the little human of having to learn implies for it an initial uncertainty, something interrogative to which answers must be given. Not the kind of answers that destroys the interrogation and silences, but the kind that reassures, deepens, and allows to continue. The little human immediately needs rules, habits, regular and constant requirements. None of these disappear in a young person. She provokes the adult to restore an order that is essentially necessary to her. If the adult misses it, provocation can go up to the big scene of despair. In conclusion, to Hersh, the problem is the lack of real adults that can educate the wonder of the young person. Here, boredom emerges next to the content that Hersh retraced in Heidegger. The young person feels the pressure of her own essence. She feels wonder and she feels that she has to be, but she does not know where to start. When the young person asks for help multiple times, but no one listens to her, the initial wonder and curiosity become boredom, namely the despair for a wonder that has been mistreated. The adults in the family should nourish the young person with love and the joy of being human, and the adults in the community should offer the young person an opportunity to fit in it. After this, both of them must demand from the young person that these opportunities are exploited in the best way. To Hersh, the most common effect of boredom in contemporary societies is the increasing use of drugs, which is still a social problem in Switzerland. And Hersh perfectly describes it here I read the second quotation of this slide. 
It is therefore understandable why some young people take refuge in their exclusive communities, their ghettos that are not places of exchange, but brown solitudes submerged by noise. They put on headphones so they do not hear each other. For the most sensitive who are also the most lost, this leads to drugs and their hellish dead ends, and also to violence, a provocation and an appeal to help. So some final indications conclude this overall induction to Hirsch's reflection on education. I have not quoted all the references in this slide, but you can find them in my paper if you are interested in them. First, to Hirsch, the child is a baby human, namely a potential human being, and she is unable to defend herself at the beginning, so she is the most dependent animal of all. Nevertheless, she has the capability of being educated. So second, she is a homo docilis, as Maritain says. The baby woman needs to learn some representation of the world that will become her starting point for deciding and existing. So third, this is the initial that constitutes the conventions which the baby human can approve, deny, or modify, maturing her convictions and thus becoming an adult. Fourth, this development from conventions to convictions is a path of information in which the baby human learns a tradition and then she has the duty to get an innovation from it, namely the innovation of her authentic original existence. In this sense, we can say that freedom is at the end rather than at the beginning of the path because the baby human can take free decision only after having received an education. And here we are to the very final remarks. To Hirsch, we can exist authentically only if we accept the human condition and its mission to incarnate what is subjectively worthy. Our acceptance must be moved by wonder and desire of restitution, because our clash with the matter is always difficult. So good reasons for not incarnating our worthy objects could always affect our use of the capability of freedom. But in our incarnative mission, we are not alone. Since we move from the natural datum of the worthy object and the past models that constitute an objective tradition, that, tradi uh, that tradition, sorry, that we have to transform into a subjective innovation. And such innovation, as we have already seen, is the incarnation of a free existence and its reality in the world. In our incarnative mission, we are not alone also because we have models in the present that can inspire us and educators that can teach us. It's exactly here that education comes in. And thanks to education, learning how to be free is not a solitary affair because we can dialogue with the other's freedom and experience the fullness of their existence. We can welcome such fullness and clash with it until we learn how to innovate it and incarnate it in our authentic existence. And our authentic existence will eventually become the wonderful model or tradition to which other authentic existences will give a new form. And that's all. <laughs> Thanks for your attention.